So hello everyone and welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed the workshops and are feeling empowered, educated and inspired. The workshop team did a, an amazing job so if we could all just give them a little um, virtual applause that would be lovely. Um, so yeah, my name is Eleanor, my pronouns are she, her and I'm the events director for Medical History and I'm honoured to be your host for our final event for today. Um, so to end this incredible weekend of feminist health research, we have a medical education panel where we will be chatting with leading healthcare professionals who work to dismantle gender bias in their practice. So let me introduce our amazing panelists. And if the panelists, after I introduced you, if you could unmute yourselves and give us a wave and say hello, just so we can put the names to the faces. So first up, we have Dr. Blair Peters, pronouns he, they, who is an assistant professor in both the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and the Department of Urology at Oregon Health and Science University. He focuses on sensory and erogenous outcomes in gender affirming surgery. Outside of clinical practice, he is both a member and advocate, advocate for the LGBTQIA community, where he's a strong queer voice in medicine and surgery. So Blair, if you could give us a wave. Hi everyone, thank you so much for that introduction. I'm very happy to be here and appreciate the invitation. Thank you, Blair, we're excited to have you here. Next up, we have the amazing Chris Grant, pronouns they them, who is a non-binary trans psychotherapist who runs The Queer Therapist, a UK-based online accredited therapy service dedicated to providing queer and gender-affirming therapy for trans, gender non-conforming and non-binary people. They also work as a lead primary care counsellor and psychotherapist for an adult clinical psychology department and occupational therapy department in NHS Forth Valley. Chris, if you could give us a wave. Hi there, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that lovely welcome. Thank you, Chris. Um, next up, we have Erica M. McAfee, she, her, um, who is the founder of Sisters in Loss, LLC a grief and fertility coaching company that helps black women replace silence with storytelling around pregnancy loss and infertility. Erica is a birth and bereavement doula, grief and fertility coach, first lady of Gaskins Chapel AME Church, a mum to two angels in heaven and one rainbow baby Maxwell. She is an alumnus of Virginia Commonwealth University with a BS in chemical engineering. I'm not sure if Erica's managed to join us yet, but hopefully she will join us in a little while and we can have her wave and say hello to everyone. So next up, we have um, Dr. Jessica Thompson, she, her, who is a graduate of Mercer University's Doctor of Physical Therapy program. A proud Mississippi native, she currently lives and works in the Metro Atlanta area as an orthopedic and pelvic physical therapist. Jessica also co-hosts the Core 4 Momentum podcast, where she, along with other pelvic health PT colleagues, empower women through pelvic health, pregnancy, and postpartum related topics. So Jessica, if you could give us a wee wave. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Jessica. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Stephanie Tillman, she, her, who is a midwife in Chicago. She completed her undergraduate degree in global health and medical anthropology at the University of Michigan and her graduate degree in midwifery at Yale University. Stephanie completed the, medical, the Clinical Medical Ethics Fellowship at the University of Chicago and is now a PhD student in healthcare ethics at St. Louis University, where her focus will be consent in pelvic exams. Hi, Stephanie, please could you give us a wave? Hi, everybody, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming, Stephanie. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. It's truly a privilege to be able to talk to and hear from folk who are doing such important work. Um, I just like to quickly say that sadly, Ellie Reyes um, pronounced she, her from the Inclusive Care Project, an educational platform where healthcare providers can access training in LGBTQ plus care, is no longer able to join us today, but I just wanted to give her a quick shout out as she does some really amazing work. So please check out her work at the Inclusive Care Project. I'll just fire her. Um, at in the chat so everyone can check her out. So I'd like to kick off our panel by first asking you all, in what ways are you challenging gender bias in your own specific practices? So who would like to take the floor first?
How about Blair? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I think for me, when I think of gender bias, I just think more of like attacking gender in general, which is kind of how I run my clinical practice. Um, so I obviously practice at a university sort of within the structure of academic medicine, which is traditionally like a very rigid place with sort of professionalism defined by cisgender heterosexual white men. Um, and, you know, within that academic structure, any sort of like ism or ick exists. Um, so for me, I not only take up space in that environment, but I think I create an environment for my patients where I don't approach my clinical practice with this like biased view of like a gender binary at all. It's all about who you are, what you need from me, and teasing out what I can do to help you self-actualize and affirm yourself. So I think for me, it's about kind of the gender binary in all things, whether that's my research, my life, my clinical practice, and just really recognizing that it's bad for all of us. Um, the gender binary is extremely oppressive towards women. Um, it's responsible for all these themes like toxic masculinity. Um, outside of its impact on the queer community. So for me, I think it's just about attacking that at its core um, and trying to just embrace the concept of gender as a spectrum and not this spectrum as in a bell curve, but as an endless spectrum, like a color spectrum. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Blair. That's very important. Um, Jessica, would you like to add to that? Or share um, what ways you challenge gender bias in your own practice? Sure. Oh, when I think of gender bias, especially right now, I'm just reminded of the maternal health care crisis that we have right now um, and how Native and Black moms are dying 2.5 and three times more than their white counterparts. And so when I think about gender bias, um, I just think about how women birthing people are not being heard in health care. So um, I started with one of my colleagues, Operation Miss, and it's a program to help and to monitor women as they're um, throughout pregnancy in the first year postpartum, just to make sure that they're heard and that we monitor th those physiological changes. And when we detect distress, we're able to help them make informed health decisions about what to do going forward, whether it's education or small lifestyle modifications. And um, just to make sure they survive throughout pregnancy in the first year postpartum and beyond. Yeah, that's so important. Making sure people are informed um, in their healthcare decisions is key to um, improving healthcare. Um, Chris, what would what what do you do to challenge gender bias in your own practice? So I work um, as a private private therapist uh, for um, a practice called the the queer therapist, um, and I actually established the the queer therapist actually in the middle of the pandemic in in response to a growing demand for, I suppose, queer, queer th affirming therapy, but also um, specifically gender affirming therapy. Um, I, I really see my role where I, I, I suppose I take huge responsibility as a sort of somebody who identifies as trans, non-binary, queer, and also a professional um, to be able to carve out a different space and to be able to provide a space that, um, certainly when I was growing up, there wasn't, there wasn't a space like this available. So I think my vision, you know, when I'm thinking about, you know, okay, what is, how am I challenging gender bias? I think, I think the very nature of, of my practice is, is fundamentally about radically challenging gender bias and about existing outside of those structures. Um, and, and, and and yeah, I think you know I'm I'm I suppose I'm coming from the sort of trans side of things, but I think queer queer therapy or queer affirming therapy is is so much about you know recognizing privilege and intersectionality and class and race and all of these difficult conversations. Yeah, that's very important. We we can't begin to look at gender bias by itself. We need to look at all of these other factors that um affect healthcare um, and you're the queer therapist does so so many amazing things for that. Um, Stephanie, what are the ways that you challenge gender bias in your practice? Uh, it's wonderful to hear everybody chatting and hearing about how we all overlap in some of our thinking. Um, 
in midwifery in the US, and I'm learning more in terms of midwifery um, in the UK, generally it tends to be a lot of cis straight women who are midwives or who are leaders in midwifery. Um, and that then engenders a lot of assumptions about who we're taking care of. And so as an out queer provider, I have a lot of queer people in my practice, but also then engage in leadership as an out queer person, which I fully recognize as a cis femme person gives me all sorts of power in those spaces. Um, and I look to my trans and non-binary colleagues to then tell me what has been tried, what hasn't worked when they've been in those spaces and either pushed out or excluded from those spaces. Um, I also, through sort of my own niche area and consent in public care, whether that's in abortion, sexual and reproductive health, or in um, pregnancy spaces, really talk with providers about how to think differently about queer people and what it means to experience public care um, because of the different or um, unknown types of sex that queer people have for straight people. It's very confusing for straight people to realize um, the different uh, experiences intimately and sexually that queer people have and what that may mean for consent in healthcare spaces. Um, and also to talk more and more about how the face of midwifery needs to be changing. So to reflect on what Jessica brought up about um, Black and Indigenous and Latina uh, patients, but also providers who needs to be um, at the forefront because these are the people we're taking care of. Um, and like Blair, I'm in academic setting so in the free clinics uh, system in Chicago and then in community hospital system so um, mostly as a Spanish speaker I take care of um, almost exclusively Spanish speakers and really thinking about you know for cis straight white people who can advocate for what and who knows about what versus other people who um, may not be safe advocating for certain things in certain spaces or may not even know that they have the power to do so. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, that's I liked the point that you made about not just speaking, but also listening to people. I think that's something that people can often forget. Um, so thank you all so much for sharing um, on that. Yesterday, we had a lived experience panel. And one of the key things that was said was that it can be really hard to find a healthcare professional that respects you and your gender. So hearing what all you what all of you are doing is so refreshing and hopeful um, and really inspiring as well. So talking of inspiration, what led to you um, to utilize social media for health education? And what have been some of the challenges that, that have accompanied your, your work? Um, I'm also popping these questions in the chat if anyone needs to remind themselves of the question. Um, so how about we go to Chris first? Yeah, so this was a big debate for me as a therapist in, in training, you are not encouraged to have a public persona at all. And it, it, it was a huge challenge, I, I think, for me to be able to kind of get over this, um, I guess, th this uh, maybe stigma around a public image. Um, my decision to, to, I guess, choose or utilize social media was actually about challenging ideas within psychotherapy um what, what i kind of coin as some, something that is visible accountability so what what that essentially means is that um i want to be transparent with my values to my prospective clients and patients um so that they they will have an understanding of what 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 practice what my practice is um, so that will be things like, you know, they will know that I'm a trauma informed therapist, they will know that I am, they will know that I have an awareness of what gender affirming therapy looks like. So I, I guess I had to get over myself and be okay with being public about my politics, because, you know, I guess the personal is political in this sense. Um, so once I made, once I made that leap, um, yeah, there, I guess there was huge, huge, um, I guess, yeah, uh, amazing feedback uh, from online, various different online communities. Um, and I think part of that was in response to the lack of visibility that we see across a lot of the mainstream of mental health professions. Um, another kind of factor in this was I wanted to democratize um, psychoeducational tools. 
and psychoeducational resources that, you know, again, historically within the trans, non-binary and queer communities, it, to some extent, there's been a lot of mistreatment. There's been a lot of abuse. And I really wanted to challenge that. I wanted to kind of step out and say, have this, have this information. Ultimately, knowledge is power. And why should that be gate, gate kept? Or why should that be only for um, a certain a certain type of privilege in order to have access to? Um, some of the main, I guess, challenges that I have is um, it's simply capacity. 95% of my time I'm, I'm with my clients or I'm doing kind of business admin. If I had more time, I would be doing far more posting and far more stories. Um, but I, I certainly think the, um, the positives certainly outweigh the negatives. Um, I've been able to reach, you know, international communities and just, yeah, hear, hear so many different experiences and stories from across the world. Yeah, it's so good to hear that the positives outweigh the negatives. And I must applaud you for your, your bravery in creating that platform when it would have been a risk for you when you first did it. Um, so well, well done to you for that. Um, could we hear from Stephanie next? Sure. So um, my undergrad degree was in uh, global health and medical anthropology. So for me, I started my career um, as more of a balcony view person, how to reach as many people as possible, how to think in ways that communities um, could understand what was being uh, shared or what messaging um, may be important. And I worked in um, HIV research advocacy and um, loved the ability to reach broad groups of people very quickly in different ways. When I then became a clinician now almost 10 years ago, it was such a shift to then work one-to-one -one and realize with each one-to-one -one person how um, exactly what Chris was saying, how things are gatekept and how little people know when they walk into a space of um, what's about to happen or um, what options there may be or um, what a good provider looks like versus a terrible provider and how to fire a healthcare provider, for example. Um, and I was really surprised at how much that affected me, this one-to-one -one piece, let alone how it was affecting the people I was honored to take care of. So social media, and it, I started out blogging because back in 2012, that was like the, um, the initial space. So I was doing more like blogging type work and um, social media was kind of on the back burner and now social media is totally different. But um, I feel like that kind of speaks to my public health heart. Uh, how do I get to more people quickly uh, to communicate from the clinical setting? What are these one-to-one -one conversations that continuously come up that if I could reach maybe more people or collaborate with people like the ones on this panel, how could we all reach people more quickly and with um, a more inclusive and supportive message to say, here's how this could all look different. Um, so I love social media for that way. I also, as um, a socialist, which is where a lot of my um, morals and ethics come from, is from a political stance. I find that social media is almost like street activism, but in a way that people can go back to, in a way that people can access in ways that um, not everybody can feel safe or comfortable being in the streets, um, and also challenge and comment and share. And there's something about kind of this permanent activism piece that when you put something out and say, you know, here's where I'm at, um, have at it, <laughs> and I will or won't engage, um, depending. Uh, I really love it in that way. So sometimes when uh, I feel like I'm um, really being forthright and um, opinionated, that, that feels good to me as someone who's comfortable with street advocacy. And when I feel like, okay, let me test the waters here, let me put something out, that also feels like a clinical place to say like, okay, let's, let's come together to figure out um, how to have this kind conversation or where to go from here. So I love that uh, social media evolves too. Like I'm a different person on Twitter than I am on Instagram. Uh, and it's nice to play around in those spaces too and see how people are different in those spaces. 
Thank you, Stephanie. Would you say there are any that you've experienced any specific challenges while using social media throughout the past few years? Oh, yeah, uh, I would love others to share, too. I got into a very uh, turf conversation uh, with a British feminist yesterday um, about uh, some issues. <laughs> I don't want to name names because their initial response was to tell me that I should have a lawyer because they have one. So there are very interesting responses that people have to being called out in different areas. Um, the whole calling in, I think we could all debate that forever. <laughs> I don't, I'm not big on um, calling in TERFs in particular, um, but having, um, sure, there are challenges. And again, as a cis femme, like I'm more comfortable maybe having some of those discussions than other people are safer than other people. But um, yeah, I think when I'm called out, I take a beat and think about like, okay, why am I, what happened? Where did I go wrong? How can I think differently? Why is this person um, calling me to uh, reconsider what I've said or what I've put out there? Um, and I think that's an opportunity for people who are humbling themselves before the learning experience that we all have. Um, and then there's ways that that can get shut down. But I would love to hear what happens for other people in terms of midwifery and in terms of feminism. I feel like turf issues come up a lot, especially when talking about queer folk. So. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, can we go to Jessica next? Would you like to share um, what led you to utilize social media for health education and what have been some of the challenges that you've faced from doing that? I will say that I honestly started to seek as a student to seek education on pelvic physical therapy through social media. And it was from meeting someone on Facebook that became like my mentor in pelvic health PT that that's kind of like where I started. And she had a community where as a student, she allowed me to help um, educate those who were pregnant about pregnancy related topics relating to physical therapy and physical health. And that's where it started for me. Um, and once I graduated, I wanted to kind of make my own platform to educate like my followers and maybe bring more on. So for me, it started with me being a student, just seeking that knowledge because pelvic health physical therapy is a very, very niche area. It's very small. Um, you don't learn much about it in many programs. You have to seek your education from um, different continuing education courses and me finding that practitioner on Facebook, like she kind of sparked so much for me. So it started with me um, that way. And honestly, when I graduated from physical therapy school, I made like a new year's resolution to start a page. And so I'm the type of person, if I write something down, I want to do it. So I did it and it's been great so far. And I love it because it helps me see just other clinicians that I aspire to be like one day and I get to network with people and I've met people that I've been able to um, interview for my podcast, Core for Momentum. So it's just, it's a really fun way to kind of bring us all together. Like I like to meet people who are passionate about what I'm passionate about um, and to kind of just build that network that we need to reach the audience that we want to serve. So I think social media is just the best way to do that, especially in the middle of a pandemic where you can't just like organically meet people like go you know, get coffee, like, you know, like you probably used to do. <laughs> so it's just really fun to meet people through um, social media. And I would definitely agree with Chris that the biggest challenge is just time. Like when you have a full time job and you bring a documentation home as a clinician and it's like, oh, dang, I have not made a post like all week, I need to let people know I'm like, I'm still here, I still care about you and I want you to get this um, information. So that's definitely my biggest challenge. And I also wanna say, Chris, like I love to hear you speak and I could just listen to you talk all day. I just love you. <laughs> thank you so thank much, you. that's so kind. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Jessica. That's so supportive. And it's so nice to hear that you're inspired to make a platform by someone similar to you. And it's led to you making this great platform. Um, so just lastly, Chris, uh, Blair, would you like to share um, what led you to utilize social media for health education and share any challenges you've experienced on the way? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, my decision to start using social media was definitely, I guess, non-traditional for academic circles, especially like being in a competitive surgical specialty like plastic surgery and um, at an academic institution. For me, you know, as someone that was interested in gender affirming surgery in my own residency training, um, there was like a complete paucity of information, even in like art literature and surgical circles. And that really made me think, okay, well then like, how the heck do people that desire gender affirming surgery actually have any idea like what their options are. And there's just such a massive amount of misinformation out there. Um, and the trans community has really had to rely on just like word of mouth and message boards and a ton of self advocacy. And I found myself in a situation where I had the privilege to be one of the first ever gender surgery fellows in North America. Um, and I'm one of a few people that offers face, chest and genital surgery. So actually can answer almost any question that someone might pose about gender surgery. So it started for me initially just as a space to post reliable information that was directly from a surgeon without many, many, many intermediaries. Um, and then sort of through that process, I started just getting a lot of messages from um, LGBTQ plus physicians and residents and medical students um, that were sort of talking about the visibility and the representation I was providing as this person in academic medicine, um, especially as someone in surgery, which is this, you know, traditionally very sort of exclusive white boys club. Um, and then I started to sort of lean on that a little bit more and then think about how I didn't have a single like queer or out mentor um, or anyone ahead of me that I could see in academic spaces. Um, so then I started talking a lot more about queer visibility and representation and have started really focusing on taking up space, but also making space to bring a lot of other people into that room with me. Um, acknowledging that, you know, I'm cis-ish, white, have a lot of sort of cis passing privilege. Um, and then I think that's where my social media sort of led me. It's a combination of education about gender affirming surgery, but it's also sort of, I think, my own resistance to academic culture and trying to shift that needle. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think it's trying to create more doors into that ivory tower. Um, as far as challenges go, definitely have had my fair share. I got a lot of pushback from um, sort of other academic surgeons and a lot of our um, journals that I publish in, um, just sort of, you know, fearing what it was gonna do for your professional career trajectory. My own parents aren't a huge fan of me being on social media. I think they're very like, the less visibility is better. And I don't think they quite understand the concept if you have to be visible provide representation, which is what we need for meaningful change. Um, and I've had a lot of online attacks, I think recently too. Um, I recently had like my photo be circulated around Twitter calling me like the new angel of death and making up all these like lies about me operating on kids for genital surgery and all just like totally ludicrous stuff. But I think courtesy of what I do, um, unfortunately gender surgery has become very politicized and I'm a very visible person in gender surgery and I'm also outspoken. So that's put me in this sort of position where, you know, all my email addresses have been signed up for various sort of hate mail groups and all these things. So um, I think that shocked me a little bit, especially the last couple months, as my page grew a little bit more, I wasn't totally ready for um, all of that. But um, it's a journey. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sorry, that's something you've experienced. But I um, also, thank you for sharing um, that. It, I think people can look at your Instagram pages and just see like all the positives, but then forget that there's people behind them that are putting themselves in vulnerable positions. And um, yeah, so thank you. Um, so now we know some of the challenges associated with social media and health education. It would be really interesting to hear your thoughts on what role social media should play in spreading information related to health. Um, for example, in 10 years time, how would you hope that social media is being used to educate on healthcare? Um, so who would like to go first for that one? We'll go first on that one. I, I love social media and how I think people get a lot of their news from social media, good or bad. I mean, that's where people get their information from now. 
So I think help, as healthcare professionals, we have to be present. And like Blair said, we have to be visible because of misinformation that is out there, like Blair said. So I think the role of social media for, for us would be um, just to kind of grab people's attention, you know, put out the evidence-based um, resources for people to learn about regarding their health. But I don't think it should be like the end all be all. Like you should not get all of your health education from social media. I feel like it should kind of grab your attention. You know, you learn something and then you kind of go forward and, you know, find the healthcare providers that relate more to you and, you know, seek the expert opinion and then also, you know, go farther into the evidence and the resources that they provide and then make your informed healthcare decisions. So I think it's like, it's a good step in the right direction. And I think we should all be doing it and we should be more visible because people don't know the resources that they have available for them. Um, but it's, I don't think it's the last, the last step. Yeah, I think that's very important. It's almost like social media has had to step in to pick up where everything else hasn't quite done its job. And who else would like to talk on that point? Uh, I can say a couple of things. So I do a lot of um, clinical research, um, write and publish quite a bit in sort of peer reviewed journals. And the thing I always find very frustrating is the only people that have access to those peer reviewed journals are people that belong to um, academic institutions that can afford to purchase this massive library and access all that information. Um, and the peer review process is critical for sure. Like I'm, I'm definitely not um, underestimating that as someone that both reviews manuscripts and publishes manuscripts. But oftentimes, especially when I'm writing papers on like genital gender affirming surgery and all these topics, um, the community are the people that really need that information. And I find it really frustrating that in order to publish, you're basically giving up the copyright access and control of a lot of your intellectual property. So I've been recently making two versions of figures as I'm putting papers together so that I can sort of bypass that copyright process and still like share information openly on social media. But I'm hoping that we can get to a place where open access is a greater thing. Unfortunately, what's going on right now in the medical world is yes, journals have sort of their closed off and then their open access equivalent but it's almost become this kind of dumping ground where you can just pay money to publish something. And it's almost like bypassing the peer review process in some ways, which isn't the answer either. Um, so I think social media is really important and I'm sort of in my own little circle working on my own strategies to figure out, okay, I need the legitimacy of the peer review process to really go through the scientific process to validate these findings but then they're like locked in a box that no one can see, which isn't helpful either. So I think I'm working on an information dissemination piece of it, but unfortunately a lot of our like hierarchical and rigid structures make that very difficult. No, that's so exciting to hear. I was, I, when I finished my undergrad a year and a bit ago, I was really shocked when I couldn't access journals anymore and they're like hundred pounds. So I was like, oh, oh dear. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's, I'm excited to hear that you're doing that. Um, Stephanie or Chris, would you like to go next? Sure. So I think right now, maybe in the past couple years and increasing, um, social media has been this really transformative place for um, full scope pregnancy management in particular. So if I think about self-managed abortion, for example. Um, for a very long time, people were self-managing abortions, whether they were doing it correctly, incorrectly, whether they had access to medications or not, whether or not they knew emergency signs or not. And social media, for example, has really galvanized um, information sharing around self-managed abortion. Um, and that has in the US has applied in a lot of different spaces in terms of um, where people do not have access to abortion but need access, um, where they may need to travel very long distances and actually to be able to do so um, would create higher risk for them medically or related to the pregnancy, um, or if they just don't have access at all. So self-managed abortion um, 
on social media has been really incredible to see how it's um, been open access information sharing um, so that people who either aren't safe in medical spaces or aren't safe in their state or community accessing care um, has really helped people um, understand more about how that's abortion is pretty easy. It's not that complicated. Um, especially depending on how far along somebody is. So in terms of um, gender-based care, anybody who can get pregnant may need to access an abortion. And that really has um, opened up that conversation. Similarly, queer people for a long time have been figuring out how to get pregnant outside of the healthcare system. Um, and that may be the safest and easiest way for them to get pregnant, but many people may also need support in um, figuring out how to get pregnant or figuring out why they aren't able to get pregnant. Um, and there have been a lot of social media movements to demystify um, fertility and conceiving. And um, there are so many incredible people who are doing work to talk about how you inseminate at home, how you access sperm if your partner doesn't have sperm. And um, so really talking people through all the different ways that um, full scope fertility, pregnancy, abortion, um, and perinatal care can and uh, be accessed, especially during the pandemic, people who are pregnant are not necessarily sick. Pregnancies can be a very normal, uncomplicated thing. Sometimes it's very complicated. I am um, not someone who um, disparages the importance of hospital-based care. I'm a hospital-based midwife. So um, I very much understand how quickly things can get complicated, but pregnancy is also super normal for a lot of people. And during the pandemic, just speaking to Chicago in particular, many people sought um, birth care, postpartum care outside of hospital settings because hospitals became ICUs. Chicago, um, our hospitals were transformed um, and were not necessarily safe spaces for people who were otherwise undergoing very normal pregnancies. Um, so independent birth center care, home birth care, um, particularly with providers who are licensed and capable of doing that care outside of hospital settings. Um, those also through social media, people learned way more about how um, to access safe care outside of unsafe settings. Um, so I think you know, fertility and pregnancy care have really um, taken off on social media, and that's been lovely to see. Yeah, that's so great to hear. Um, especially in some of those instances, being able to access it at home will make it a much more relaxing and enjoyable experience for um, patients. Um, Chris, I'd love to hear your um, thoughts on social media and the future. Of yeah, um, so, I, you know, I think speaking from sort of mental health and trans non-binary in particular I think these are communities that th absolutely thrive on sort of online spaces online platforms and um, so it only makes sense that you know social media or advancing sort of healthcare on social media is a really good way of tackling again, health uh, inequality or health inequity within trans and gender non-conforming people. Um, like Blair said, I think, you know, it, it, it's, it, of course there is, of course we need to peer review um, the papers, the, the articles that we're putting out there, but it, it's quite amazing when we're able to literally put a couple of one-liners out there that is free, um, that is accessible by, all ages, all races, all genders, um, that, and that is a really powerful thing. Um, for me, I definitely see social media being this, um, I guess what I mentioned earlier, it is there to, it, it has the potential to really democratize uh, healthcare. And I think where it gets a bit hairy or a bit tricky is, you know, it, it's, it's about putting out resources that are, are factual, are evidence-based. Um, rather than misinformation. Um, so that, of course there are pitfalls, but I think again, the, the positives outweigh the negatives. Yeah, and on that same front, it's important that we give people like yourselves the platform to drown out the fake news. So everyone should go and follow you all because that would, that would help. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for sharing all on that. Um, so I think a lot of our audience here today um, are here because they're hoping to pursue a career in healthcare, myself included. So I think it's important that we discuss the ways in which healthcare professionals can help to deconstruct and dismantle inequities in healthcare. 
Um, so who would like to go first with this question? Um, I just think the best way we can deconstruct those inequities is to call them out. Um, even if like you're listening right now and you are a student, I can tell a, a brief story when I was a student and a professor said something that was offensive to me. Um, and I was able to call it out in a respectful way in his office after class that day. Um, and he was just not aware that what he said was offensive. And it's not a bad thing. I don't think a lot of times people don't know what they say are offensive or what they do is offensive, but they will never know if you don't say it. So the first thing you can do is call it out as a student or as a healthcare professional, because sometimes as a healthcare professional, we, uh, professional, we see our colleagues doing things or saying things or, you know, making decisions for patients that are biased in different ways. And sometimes they're not aware of it. And we just can't let these things go unsaid. And I feel like that's why we're in this maternal health care crisis right now in our country, because people have had these mindsets and they have put these stereotypes on these people for years and years and years, and they're not realizing how it's literally killing people. Um, so what we have to do just as individuals, outside of healthcare, just as individuals, recognize when someone, even if it's someone who doesn't look like you or someone you don't personally identify with, if you see someone being um, just mislabeled or mistreated, we have to call it out. Yeah, thank you. That's very important. And I like that you mentioned that it's not just for um, health educators or healthcare workers, it's that's for everyone to do. Yeah. Um, who would like to follow on from Jessica? Yeah, I, I can jump in there. To totally agree with you, Jessica. I think, you know, as, as scary as it is, we have to be brave, we have to be courageous, and we have to, you know, I, I guess the thing is, it's it's being authentic in these spaces. It's being authentic when we think perhaps we're the only one in this space with, whether it's queer or gender diverse or neurodiverse, um, it's, it's, it's being brave enough to actually say, well, hold on, is there another way of doing things here? Um, and I think, yeah, actively challenging and opposing the structures that have, you know, previously supported that sort of mainstream, well, in relation to psychotherapy, um, but but services on the whole, um, where I, I think in, in my mind, how I see it is it, ultimately this is about a tipping point. If enough voices are heard, if we are able to, um, if enough people stand up, a tipping point will happen. Things are, are already changing bit by bit. Um, and and, and it, is these, it is these daily, daily, um, I guess, acts, radical acts of courage, I think that change things. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I think that's a lovely way to put it, that you don't need to do something humongous to tip the, to tip the seesaw. But um, if you just pop yourself on the right side, then one day enough people will be there to make it tip. Um, Stephanie or Blair, would you like to go next? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, sort of building on what Chris was saying, anytime I'm asked about um, creating change or increasing representation or anything like that, I often sort of, I think there's this misunderstanding that, you know, in order to do that, you need to take on the people that are like the radical hard nose or like the people that are the most up against you. But the reality is, is accompliceship or allyship or whatever your sort of chosen term is, it's on this spectrum and the radicalists are on like either end of that. But most people sort of exist in this like passive allyship or state of neutrality, but most of them actually agree with equity and equality and want those things. But if you're someone that has privilege, then you have the privilege to like not really deal with it. And that's sort of most of the people that also have most of the power in our society and especially in these professional organizations so when i give talks and lectures and speak to people like i'm not going to like the hardcore republican evangelical institutions and like having these conversations it's a complete waste of my time i'm speaking to the people that are 
just reasonable human beings that have a lot of privilege and because of that also have a lot of ignorance and then sort of educate them about the fact that your lack of education isn't more important than someone else's dignity and have those conversations and really try to shift them from that state of neutrality or passive allyship into actual action. And that's actually most people in our society, especially most professionals and a lot of people that hold power. Um, so in terms of those small changes that add up, I think it's like having that lens is helpful to realize I don't actually have to go up the, against like the really loud people that are giving me all the pushback, go against the one, go up to the ones that are quietly supporting you and then bring them up with you. Um, and that's been my approach. It's I think been very successful up to this point. Um, and like Jessica said, like calling out oppression is super important, but especially if you're someone that has privilege, you can leverage. Um, I look at it in academia and like, sure, I'm this like very loud queer person in healthcare and all that, but I also am white and I also kind of pass as a cis person. And I think of, you know, my co-fellow from this past year, who's a black woman in surgery and see the differences in the microaggressions with how we're treated. And, you know, you really have to own the fact, like, if I can't do this and be loud and shift this space, then how the heck is, like, a Black queer woman supposed to do that? Um, so I think also just owning your own responsibility and accountability is critical. Yeah, thank you, Blair. It's definitely important to own your, own your privileges and use them in any way you can. Um, Stephanie, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I... Um... It's so validating to hear what other people are saying and also really also just, I don't know, I feel inspired hearing what other people are saying too. So I hope that's resonating for attendees also. But um, I feel like in, in my own work, I've just left clinical practice. Now I'm mostly in academia as a PhD student, but um, part of my clinical teaching that I was doing and the practice that I was doing, I was trying to focus on concordancy. So this idea that the people we're taking care of, um, we reflect some sort of a discriminated or marginalized identity as that person. So when I have like this increase in queer people who are coming to see me for pelvic care, I'm, um, promoting that um, as an out queer provider, for example. However, working on the South side of Chicago as a white woman, um, I am incredibly discordant with the people who I'm taking care of. And reflecting back on what Jessica was saying, there is an incredible maternal mortality crisis in this country. And so much research has been done to show that concordancy, so providers of color taking care of patients of color, lead to safer outcomes, meaning people not dying um, because of discriminatory care versus discordant patient provider dyads. So what I have tried to do in the ways that was possible within the university setting I was working with was to um, promote midwifery um, in um, communities of color. So trying to bring people into the work of midwifery so that our profession reflects the people they're taking care of. Um, and then also to really push our own practice um, to do anti-racism work, to really pay attention to what our own maternal morbidity and mortality rates are. Um, so thinking about concordancy and how we can change the face of our profession, um, midwifery in the U.S. is a largely white dominant profession, and uh, that is, again, not mostly who we're taking care of. So really trying to think about um, changing that up. But um, again, feeling safe as an out queer provider, I think has made a big difference for queer patients. Um, and then I can also do trauma-informed referrals for those people. So if I'm creating a certain type of safe space for pelvic care, for pregnancy care, if then I'm referring um, to higher level care or to higher specialized care or different specialized care to be able to do so in a way of saying, here's a fellow out queer provider. So I'm handing you off to another um, family person um, within the system or um, here is someone who I know has done their own queer informed work so they're aware of sort of what you're coming in with um, and I think that makes a difference too so when people feel safe being out and being um, to whatever degree um, themselves in their professional space I do think that that makes a difference for for patients and research shows for concordancy it does that's a really interesting point point. Um, and yeah, I think, especially well, in the UK, which is where I am, um, 
particularly medicine can be very like middle class white focused. So yeah, having it where you said that you were um, promoting midwifery to, um, you know, non non white people is very important. Um, and I hope that something like that happens in the UK as well, because our system for getting people into medicine is very, uh, it's not inclusive at all. So yeah, fingers crossed for um, more progression. Um, so before we pass on to the audience for a Q&A session, a very quick Q&A session, it'd be great if you could each share your top tips um, for other health educators to combat medical sexism, shame and stigma. And um, if you could maybe give your top tip or your top two tips, that would be really great. Um, how about we just start with Blair? Yeah, I think my my top tip is owning your own power. Um, it's very uncomfortable to feel like you're going up against someone that has more power than you, especially if you're going to encounter resistance. Um, the more you do it, the easier it gets. But also understanding if you're someone that is systematically marginalized and excluded, sometimes just existing in a space is enough. Um, so we're not all gonna have the same amount of power in different spaces. And I think for people like me that have a lot more power and privilege than other individuals, well then my burden of that work is much larger. Um, so understanding, I think, you know, what you should expect of yourself more than anything is important. Thank you, Blair. Um, Jessica, do you want to go next? Your top tip or top two tips? Um, I would just say my top thing is to learn what you're passionate about and who are the people that benefit from your passion and then just to build your tribe. So find other like-minded people who want to serve that same population and who are passionate about what you're passionate about because um, I think you can just go farther when you have a team. Mm, I really like that. Yeah, a team makes a big difference. <laughs> um, Stephanie, do you want to go next? Sure, yeah, I echo that idea of building community. So really finding other people who, if you hear something or feel something like, I don't think that's right. I don't think they've said that right. Or I don't think that that's framed correctly. And being able to bounce that off of others to say, you know, I think that we should be thinking about this differently and how can we do that, I think is really helpful. I also try and think about this from the patient perspective. So anyone who's receiving healthcare, what do you do if you're experiencing stigma or you're in a situation where something doesn't feel right? And I tell people all the time, you can fire a healthcare provider. <laughs> you can walk out of the middle of a visit. You can turn off your Zoom. If something doesn't feel right, it might not be right. Um, and our gut intuition is all we've got sometimes. So if you feel like something's not right, um, in no way do you have to continue along with that healthcare. And when I think about pelvic healthcare, for example, if you're just talking with a provider and they make you not feel right, by no means do you need to have an exam with that person. So if just discussing things feels wrong, move on. And definitely that comes from a place of, you could fire someone and find someone else. <laughs> and that's not the case in all places. Um, but just know that you can say like, I think I'm done for today. Um, being in a healthcare space doesn't mean that you just have to go along with it. There are wonderful people who become health providers, health educators, um, and there are terrible people who become health providers and health educators. So um, trust your gut and uh, find your community. And then also from the patient standpoint, bring an advocate with you. And I know with COVID that can be really difficult, but um, in clinical care settings, having a patient advocate, like a person on the phone, a friend, a family member, even just on speaker, um, I encourage my patients, like if you would have somebody with you today, do you want them on the phone? Um, some people prefer a private visit, um, but making sure that there's somebody else who can reconcile when something's not right um, can be really helpful too. Thank you, Stephanie. Our lived experience panel yesterday said similar that um, some things that really helped them as a patient were having people, family members or friends with them that supported them um, unconditionally in their health experience. Um, last but not least, Chris, would you like to share your top tips? 
Yeah, so my top tips to health educators would be really try to learn um, what trauma-informed care actually is. So the principles of trauma-informed care and try to really try to embed that into your practice. That is one of the biggest, biggest things that you can do. Um, I think as health educators, we can also um, at least try where possible to be critical thinking when it comes to things like peer reviewed journals. Yes, like these are peer reviewed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that clinical trials have covered all ages or all genders or um, and, and specifically I'm talking about in relation to mental health and neurodiversity. So this is a big growing area that I think we'll be hearing a lot about in the future. Um, so critical thinking when it comes to um, certainly the papers that you're reading. And if you are an underrepresented, underrepresented healthcare provider, take up space. Just take up space. It doesn't matter how scary it is. If you can take up a bit of space, try. Thank you, Chris. That's really important to hear. Um, just before we, we wrap up this panel, um, we've got a few minutes to take some questions from the audience. Um, we can do one to two questions. These could be directed to a specific speaker or just to everyone. If you fire them into the chat now, that would be great. I'll just give people a few moments to do that. I'm just gonna have a drink of water. As well, if our panelists would like to ask any of the other panelists a specific question, um, feel free to do that as well. I'll just give everyone one more minute just in case there's any questions that come up. Here we've got a question. So it says, I know that Blair mentioned this briefly, but do you have any tips for healthcare students who want to challenge oppression, but also need to balance their own safety and well-being? Um, who would like to have a go at that one. Um, I guess I can start on that one. I feel like I get that question in different iterations pretty frequently. Um, I hold kind of weekly mentorship office hours for um, queer identified students and often what we talk about is less about like choice of medical specialty and more like implications of choice of medical specialty and understanding um, the various oppressions of the medical system and then how do you deal with those and I would never pretend like I have all the answers like I have some lived experience but I don't have intersectionality and my experience is not going to be what everyone else's is for a whole variety of factors um, and then also acknowledging that the more junior you are, the harder it can be to challenge power and inflict change, especially because you're more dependent on all, all the people in front of you to actually advance your career. Um, so your comfort and your willingness to take on those things will increase as you become more senior. Um, but I think when you're starting out earlier on, I found when I was in those situations, peer support is often the best first step. Um, being able to lean on people that are at your level that are non-threatening and there's also power in numbers. Um, so if you can find people on your level and it's not just you against an organization, you have a group of people, um, start there. And before going to something like the head of a hospital or a department, often starting within your own medical school or the own organization that's actually responsible for your wellness and protection, um, that's where you should go first before you sort of put yourself out there with the people that potentially can 
inflict harm should they disagree with what you're bringing up. Um, so I think just bolster your support before you're entering the battlefield, um, I guess, is uh, the main point that I make. But every system's a little bit different. Um, but that's usually a safe place to start. Thank you. Oh, also, oh, I'm sorry. No, on you go. <laughs> My bad, Eleanor. But I was just add, I definitely agree with what Blair said because the one time that I did feel oppressed in a situation with a professor, I did let a peer know, hey, I'm going to go in his office and tell him about this. And I would also just add to keep receipts. So if it's a situation where you're going to confront somebody, I will send a follow-up email and say exactly what was said and what was talked about. And so if if you're afraid that like they're gonna be um they're gonna come back for you as far as how they grade you or something like that like have receipts like this conversation happened and I feel like they are like, targeting me in a way um just for your safety and well-being like you asked thank you Jessica I think that's really important for people to know I'm, I'm just going to wrap up with this last question, which I think is a very important one for people discuss, to discuss, which is, what do you as healthcare professionals need from people working in public health departments to do to combat gender inequities? Um, do either Chris or Stephanie want to comment on that one? So something that I've been encouraging a lot within, so outside of my private practice, I also work for um, the, the NHS here in the UK, and uh, I, I've been encouraging a lot and have made, you know, good inroads, I guess, with um, a lot of different departments within the um, health board that I work in is something quite simple as um, pronouns and signatures. And, you know, that, that's quite small, but actually for, you know, working within these kind of big structures that have you know probably have very old systems in place um that can be a really big inroad and it gets people thinking it gets people talking about this it, it starts to normalize conversations in particular um around gender and uh transgender uh related things thank you chris stephanie did you want to add something quickly to that and then we'll wrap up yeah, absolutely agree with Chris. I think another piece, especially for public health folks who write policy or who write um, broad community statements, be inclusive in your language. So um, thinking, for example, about pregnancy or abortion policy, when it's very gendered and binary language, uh, people don't feel safe uh, receiving health care that applies to that policy, or they may not feel like it applies to them. And so it's really important to write public health statements that don't assume anything about people's identities who are seeking care. It's very easy to do, and very likely there are people who will edit your statements or edit your content for inclusivity. So if it's all cis straight folks writing, writing something, reach out um, to a consultant in your area to do some editing because really it's, it's pretty easy to be inclusive. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That's a very important point. Um, so I think that concludes our panel. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to all our panelists, Blair, Stephanie, Chris, and Jessica. Uh, thank you so much for giving up your time to come and speak to us and educate us. Um, if anyone would like to give them a follow on social media, I highly recommend you do. So I've just fired their ats into the chat. So you can find Blair at the Queer Surgeon, Chris at the Q Therapist, Stephanie at Feminist Midwife, and Jessica at Dr. RJT underscore the Pelvic PT. I um, highly recommend following them all. And thank you again for joining us.